praise up to the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, oh, oh. Hallelujah. Number 248. There is a name. You know, February is usually a month where people talk about love for some strange reason. I don't know why. I talk about love every day. That's me. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But oh, how I love Jesus. Verse 1 and 3. There is a name. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. It tells of one. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus because he first loved me. Because, because he first loved me. How he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. In his life. Oh my. 
Let us bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We praise and thank you for being here with us as you promised this day. May all we do and say be to your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Good morning to all of you here, and good morning to those of you who are watching us on television. I have to admit this right away, because even though Roger Bothwell isn't here this day, that he knows I'm gonna do this, and if I don't say something, he'll get me in the end. Um, <clears throat> many of you may be, um, knowledgeable about, I guess, his devotional 800 number and telephone, not only telephone, but email that he puts out maybe five times a week or more, even when he was so sick, they, most of the time they were still being cranked out, which was amazing to me. Anyway, he did one very recently that kind of caught my eye and I called him up and I said, Roger, the English major in me loves this, and this is what I always do when somebody catches me, as Ulysses did, to get up here. May I use part of that? And he said, of course you may. So here we are. Thank you, Roger, although I added some, to be honest. When Shakespeare's tragic character, Macbeth, hears of his wife's death, he says, and I quote, out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets upon the stage and then is heard of no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. We hear something totally opposite when we hear Jeremiah's call from the Lord. Quote, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And in Ephesians, Paul wrote, for we, are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Jeremiah wasn't any better than you or I. He wasn't privileged, but God had a plan and he had a purpose for Jeremiah, just like he does every one of you sitting here. There's something unique for us to do and each of us has talents that maybe we don't want to admit to, but we have them. And they make each one of us unlike anybody else. And in the grand scheme of things, there is something that needs to be accomplished and only you and I can do it. It gets even better in scripture. Romans 8. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Can you imagine? We're sons and daughters of God. We are not merely servants to be used and cast aside. We're members of the family. And we're joint heirs with Jesus himself. That sounds just so incredible. Now, quote, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ, Jesus our Lord. 
as Roger said, sorry, Macbeth, you were wrong. Our lives signify much more than we can possibly imagine. God bless you all. Please join Amalia and I for the call to worship, which is found in your bulletin. Amalia will read the soft print while the congregation reads the bold print with me. The sovereign who is ever present now asks for your attention. We are sorry that we do not see him more often. But today, in this place, you may know him more intimately. Today, today, today we will honor him. out a couple of things that I would direct your attention to in the bulletin. The first that is that today's offertory is Chromatic Fugue in D minor by Johann Pachelbel. And the second, as I will elaborate to you more right now, is that the, today's offering is for the college church budget. And I'm going to share with you today uh, how the college church budget has benefited Wall Street directly. And I know most of the time when we think college church budget, we don't think Wall Street. Well, I have absolute first-hand proof that it has affected Wall Street, and here's how it has done so. Downstairs is where the young adult class meets. Because of the college church budget, we have a place to meet, and we're constructing an additional barrier for us to have our own special room. If you noticed a month ago in the bulletin, we collected hats and gloves and coats and sweaters and anything else that we could take and help other people out with. Downstairs on Thursdays, we have a camera club that meets. 
and Pastor Pate came into our Sabbath school and said, someone from the camera club heard about our collection and she brought in, and when I say a garbage sack, I mean an industrial sized garbage sack, almost full of knitted winter hats. All of them, uh, well, let's just say it's a lot more work than I would be willing to put into. Good for her. And she says, I would like them to be able to take and use these. We were thrilled to have them. We were thrilled to have what other people brought to us as well, but it was special that somebody who simply comes here for camera club would bring that to us. Because of the fact that we have a college church budget, the camera club is able to meet downstairs and be warm while they're doing it. The things we were collecting were to help people who aren't as fortunate to help them keep warm. So two weeks ago, Ulysses Poyser and I took all the stuff that we collected in his vehicle and my truck, and we went to the friendly house in Worcester, which, if you haven't figured it out by now, is located on Wall Street. Shame on you if you made assumptions. If you go to Wall Street in Worcester, you will not find the street lined with expensive cars and three-piece suits and people who make a lot of stock commodities and haven't done that well since 2008. You'll meet people who haven't been doing well for quite some more time. As we walked inside with all that we had, we could hear the bouncing of balls at the gymnasium. We saw people sitting around, and we saw the shelves where you go to pick up stuff if you need to keep warm or you need things that can help you out, and it was bare. And as we walked over and started to put stuff on there, and I am not exaggerating, which I am very good at doing, but in this case I'm not, there was a lady that almost bumped us over trying to see what was in there. And it wasn't just because she was greedy. And as the volunteer there asked that people please stay back until we actually get a chance to put stuff up, there was a line already forming. I'm quite convinced, despite the fact that we took a good amount of stuff there, that it wasn't on the shelves for very long, and the shelves were bare once again. We took coats, sweaters, and hats that a lady who comes to the camera club in our basement brought as well. We're going to do that again because they say the worst time of the year for collections is post-holiday season. So if, again, you want to help out those on Wall Street who really need help, or other places as well. We encourage you to bring, but we encourage you to continue giving to the college church budget because you never know. It's not just inside these walls that it makes a difference. It reaches beyond, which is what it's supposed to do. The deacons will serve us at this time.
kind and gracious Lord, please take what we have given, help it to help us here, but more importantly, beyond these walls so that more may know the comfort and joy that comes from you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. It's now time for the children's story, if the children want to come forward at this time. A good week. It was a busy week. My mom came this week. That's always fun when, you're, when your parents come and see you when you're older. Yeah, and your grandparents came. Yeah, I know that. That's exciting. Well, um, today I want to talk a little bit about dreams. You know, when I was a, um, a little girl, I'm sure my parents dreamed big dreams for me. I'm sure they wanted me to grow up smart and intelligent and successful and all of that. I'm not sure if all their dreams came true, but I'm sure that um, all of your parents dream for you. And I, you know, I think I could come up for, with a few dreams for you too. You know, big goals. William, can I have you come up here? I need your help. Yeah, you gonna stand right here for me? William, what do you wanna be when you grow up? You don't know, that's okay, you got a lot of time. Don't worry about it. You know, um, some of the things that I think that I could probably dream for you, one of them would be I could really see you growing up to be super smart. Look at here. Here, hold this. These are, these are your glasses, and this is the book of knowledge. And everybody knows glasses make you smarter. Okay, so when you grow up, William, I dream that you're going to be very intelligent and very smart and very, very well learned. Do you want that? Yeah, okay, okay. Maybe that's not your goal. I got another one. I dream that you grew up to be the best sportsman ever. That'd be Eric. Okay, you could, you could be a successful sportsman and play sports Sorry, it's the only ball I could find. <laughs> and you could do a lot and be famous and be a, a good picture, you know, a, a good, good face on the screen. And you could tell other people about Jesus through sports. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. All right, well, I dream, actually, William, that you become ruler of the world. William for dictator. Here, here's your golden scepter. It looks kind of like a club. Do you want to grow up to be ruler of the world? Big dreams, right? Now, you see, we dream big dreams, and our parents dream big dreams, but you know who big dreams even bigger dreams for us? God. And God says in the Bible, he says, I have great plans for you, plans to prosper you. But you know, sometimes when God dreams big dreams for us, life gets in the way, and sin gets in the way, and life is cut short. And that's why I think God came up with heaven, because heaven is a place where God can dream all his dreams for us, and it can be as long as eternity for him to get them all done. And I think God dreams such big dreams that he needs all of eternity to get them accomplished. So remember, when we get to heaven, God has big dreams for you. You can go back to your seats. Good job. 
it's time for our morning congregational prayer. That means it's, uh, there's a place for this prayer in all of our lives and in our experiences. Now, some like to come down front and join us up front when we pray. And as we sing the prayer song, uh, come on down and join me. And the rest of us can join us wherever you are. If you're watching on television, uh, please join us in this prayer now as we sing. So Lord, once again, as we come to you, we thank you for the promise of your presence that you're here with us this morning, and that you hear our prayers, even the ones that are unspoken, even the ones that we carry on our hearts day by day and minute by minute, even the ones that are uh, with us in such a way that no one else knows those prayers. So we thank you for this opportunity to join together with fellow believers in such a free and open manner. We thank you for the opportunity to rest and find recreation and renewal on the Sabbath. And we thank you for this church building itself and for each who provide this place for us. We pray today that you'll take us and cleanse us and make us new in you and in Jesus and make Jesus more uh, precious in our lives and may he speak through our lives. Make us salt in this life that you have given us. I pray that you'll especially be with our prayer focus concerns, especially those with health concerns. I pray that you'll be with Pastor Pate as his shoulder heals from his surgery on Thursday. Uh, be with uh, my wife Cheryl, be with Phil, be with Amanda, be with uh, Sandra, be with Al, be with June and Linda and Adam. Be with John and Susan, Jimmy and James, Thor, and Reagan, Joel, Roger and Regina. Be with Wayne. Be with those in military service that we lift up each week. Robbie, Kelsey, Kim, and Stephen. And be with those that are studying and serving abroad. Eric and Joy and Jesse and Haley. And you do know those burdens that we carry on our hearts, Lord, for loved ones and family members and friends, issues that uh, are chronic and in crisis. So we pray for the, those prayers especially, and as we lift those up in just a moment of silence, hear our prayers, O oh Lord. So Lord, we thank you that we can come and to your presence at any moment of the day or night, in any aspect of our lives, that we don't have to be on our knees or in an attitude of prayer or with our eyes closed and our hands folded, that you do hear the desires of our hearts and answer according to your great will and wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
and today I will be serving as your text master. Our living word passage of the day is taken from 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. And this is the record, that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Samantha, I know you're serious about your religion stuff, and I don't want to make fun of it, but I have to ask you something. What is it, Craig? If Christians think they are going to live forever, what in the world do you think you're going to do? After all, someday, forever, is going to get boring. Craig, I can't believe you're actually asking that. Maybe some people, m maybe some other people, but you. Me? Why? What's so unique about me? You're one of the most fascinating people I know. You scuba dive, you snowboard, you make remote control planes, you play the oboe and the piano, and have told me that you're getting ready to tackle the guitar. Yeah? So what's that got to do with being bored with eternity? God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. I think it should be obvious, but not really. What do you mean by that? I mean, I would think you know what it's like not to have time to do everything you want to do, but there's a piece of it that I'm sure you don't get. I, I do understand some of it. I wish I could take up sailing. In fact, I'd love to make my own boat. And I do hope to make the vars varsity this year, and that's going to take time too. But what's the other part that you say I don't get? God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. What you're not thinking about isn't just having the time to do all that you want to do, but having the time to be with all the ones you want to be with. I want more time to spend with you and Carrie and Mark and Lauren and the whole gang. But more than that, I can't imagine what it's going to be like to run right up to Jesus and just hang out. That's the part I really think you don't get. These things I have written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that he that ye have eternal life. I don't deserve it, but I know that Jesus has plans for me every day into eternity, and each one is going to just get better and better, and I know it would be so much better if you'd join me, Craig. These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. May we each have the assurance of this, his word today. Thank you so much. Uh, brief explanation, I took a tumble last September. 
And uh, I thought that I, I, 35 years ago, I partially tore my rotator cuff and it healed with some effort and physical therapy and this kind of thing. And so I just assumed this was going to heal too. And it didn't, so I finally had surgery this week. So you'll be looking at me like this for about six weeks. Um, I'm doing fine, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you're aware that in, in, in Christianity, sometimes there, God must have a, 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 an incredibly difficult job. I mean, that's pretty self-evident, but he, not for him. I mean, nothing's tough for God. But God must have a, a pretty difficult job in balancing certain things, such as, uh, you know, for a long time in church history, everything, everything was all about the church. The church was the ultimate. The individual didn't mean much. And then along came the Protestant Reformation, and, and suddenly we refocused and we, we discovered that God loves the individual, that salvation isn't through the church, that salvation is, is by this individual relationship with Jesus, and the church isn't everything. And so we, maybe the pendulum has gone so far now that we sing, you know, how much Jesus loves me, that we've lost the sense of the power of what church means to him, uh, the value of church, the significance of church, that maybe we've, you know, the pendulum has shifted so far that we've lost something else. And another one that is, is very real is that Sometimes we are so humanly tempted to focus on how much the religion thing is all about me. Oh, you know, the cross is all about getting me to heaven. And the cross actually is a lot more than that. The cross has much greater significance than just getting you to heaven. And yet, because it plays on, on you know, my selfishness and my innate self-protectiveness, it's easy for me to focus on, on oh, the old rugged cross and what it means about getting me to heaven when it's, the picture is a lot larger than that. And sometimes we're so focused on my individual salvation that we don't think of the bigger picture. But even at that, I today would like to do something that's not normal for me. I'd actually kind of like to talk about heaven. You know, even though I have hesitation that focusing too much on heaven, uh, some people, they just don't really live this life. They don't start the kingdom now. They don't start living the reality of, of, of the eternal life already, right now, today. And, but even at that, every once in a while, it's not a bad deal to talk about heaven. I um, obviously set the hourglass here. And this whole concept of the passage of time and how much time is enough time? Ellen White many years ago said there are three things that you really just don't even head down that path. Don't, you know, just don't even waste your time because you're not going to come up with an answer. In fact, you can drive yourself nutso. She didn't use the words nutso. That wasn't exactly 19th century vocabulary. But uh, you can drive yourself nutso. And that is, uh, one is, where did God come from? Another one is, how long is eternity? And the third one is, how does sin begin in the heart of a perfect, in a, in a perfect universe? In any being in, the, in a perfect universe. You know, don't, even, you know, don't even wrestle in that stuff because you're never going to get anywhere. You can't come to resolution on any of those. We don't have answers for any of those. But how long is eternity? And I know that it is tempting, like, our, like Marcel was reading, it is tempting because we are human and we're temporal and we've already passed one month of 2013. Can you believe that? astounding. Because we're temporal and because we mark time, time is significant to us, sometimes the idea, the concept of eternity is frightening. I mean, what are you going to do forever? Now, let me just quite simply share something with you. The angels apparently sort of know what forever is, and it doesn't seem to bother them. The angels don't seem panicked over the idea of having forever. They, they already have a taste of what that means, and they seem okay with it. Uh, they don't, they don't, there's no reference that they want to bomb out on it, so they know better than we do. But the idea of what are we going to do forever, if you take your Bibles, please, there's a very curious verse, Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 has that famous passage that uh, 
uh, everybody knows, and especially if you grew up in the 1960s, because the birds sang to everything, turn, 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 there is a season, turn, turn, and a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, and many of you remember that. It's interesting, the, the, re the resolution of that passage, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the resolution, verse 11, there are two astounding claims in there. Really breathtaking in that one verse. The first one is, God has made everything beautiful in its time. Oh, really? Really? That one, that one takes a, a bit of faith. Tell that to the mother who just buried her child. God makes everything beautiful in its time. That's a, that's a big one. That's a, that's a deep and hard concept. God has made everything beautiful in its time. And one of the things that's listed in the timing here is a time to be born, a time to die. But God makes everything beautiful in its time. That's difficult. But notice the next phrase. He has made everything beautiful in its time, and God has set, in King James it says, has set the world in your heart. If you read almost any other translation, the word, the Hebrew word there is ha'olam, and they don't use the word world. Ha'olam represents uh, all of the cosmos, all of eternity, all of, God has put everything into your heart. God has, God has put eternity into your heart. When we lived in Arizona, some of you have heard about our, one of our favorite little dogs that we've ever had. We've had some good dogs along the way. I don't think we've ever had any bad dogs. I'm not sure there is such a thing as a bad dog. That's enough the theology for one day. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I, we, um, we, uh, one of our favorite little dogs was named Barkley. And uh, Barkley was not unlike the Ur Urbina's little Maltese, uh, Figaro. Barkley was this sweet little fuzzball. He was white, just all white with these brilliant black eyes and this black nose and uh, sticking out on this white body. And he was just a, the most loving little critter. In fact, he was in some ways too loving. Uh, he was always underfoot. He was such a people dog, I always felt like I was going to trip over him because every term, time I turned around, he was there. But Barkley was a, a wonderful, sweet animal. And uh, funny little guy, just so much fun to have around. Uh, you come home any time of the day or night, and he was the welcoming committee. You know, and, and the world was all right with him as long as you came home. He was the welcoming committee. And one of the things that was true, and some of you have heard me use this analogy before, one of the things that was true was when we lived in Arizona, in Arizona you've got sky. I mean, you really have sky in Arizona. Big sky, lots of sky. And you've got wonderful, magnificent sunsets, amazing sunsets. And um, our, our, our little Maltese dog, he was such a dingling. I'd be out there, I'd go out in the backyard and the sun would be setting over the Arizona desert. I mean, it'd just be radiant, all the, uh, the reds and the crimsons and the purples and it's just, you know, just exploding. Just, you cannot fathom the various shades and the texture. And Barkley would just be walking around the backyard sniffing nasty stuff. I mean, th there was all this available beauty and he, had, he didn't have a clue. He had, as Ellen White says in Steps to Christ, neither the desire nor the capacity to appreciate it. He just didn't have the desire or the capacity to appreciate the sunset. And it was always amazing to me because, you see, Barclay, Barclay wasn't created as you were created. In Genesis 1 and 2, it speaks of the creation, and, and I really, I am of the school that believes that Genesis 1 and 2 really is creation for dummies. It, it, I mean, that God just tried to take the most incredible, complex stuff and dumb it down so that we can even get a hint of what creation is. Just a, a, a scratching hint of creation. And for us to do more, more than that is, I, I think, just almost unfathomable for us to try to believe that we really understand the creation. That's my conviction. But you and I were created differently according to Genesis. Genesis says that God stepped out every day with a dream, a design. He was, he was going to take chaos and turn it to cosmos. He was going to take uh, this, this world and, 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 you know, I don't know, crystallize energy or whatever it, you know, whatever creation was. And he spoke and it became. And what God spoke, Maltese dogs came into being. And God stood back and he said, 
Barkley, you're all right. Nothing wrong with you. This is good. But the scripture is very clear that when it came to humanity, he had a different dream and design. He blew the wind of God, and it isn't ruach. The, the, the wind of God that often you see in other passages of, of the Old Testament, the ruach. This is, no, this, this is nephesh, this is neshama, this is a different Hebrew term. God sparked something special in his kiss. When he kissed Adam and Eve to life, he sparked something unique in that part of his creation. And he gave you something. Barclay never thought about tomorrow. He just was happy living through today. You think about tomorrow. Whether you stress about it, or whether you plan for it, or whether you're excited about it, or whether you're worried about tomorrow, it doesn't matter. You have concept of tomorrow. Barclay has no concept of tomorrow. He bounces along from day to day because God has put eternity into your heart. God did not put eternity into the heart of anything else in creation. Everything else operates off of instinct. You have eternity that God has given in your heart for you to value. That great theologian, Neil Diamond, wrote a song years ago. It reminds me of Genesis 49. You remember Genesis 49? Jacob gathers his children together around him because he knows his time is limited. He knows he's going to die. So he gathers his children around him and he speaks of the day of his death. He says, when I die, I don't want you to leave my bones here in Egypt. You know, coming down here and, and being saved by my son Joseph with all that God did and preparing him and setting him in place and saving the family. This is good. And I'm grateful in the land of Goshen. Wonderful stuff. Thank you, Pharaoh. Thank you very much. But when it's all said and done, I don't want to end up here. When I die, promise me you're not going to leave my bones in Egypt. Take my bones back to the cave of Machpelah, to the place of my father's. Neil Diamond wrote years ago, Jesus Christ, Fanny Bryce, Wolfie Mozart and Humphrey Bogart, Genghis Khan, and on to H.G. Wells, Ho Chi Minh, Gunga Din, Henry Luce and John Wilkes Booth, and Alexander's King and Graham Bell, Ramar Krishna, Mama Whistler, Patrice Lumumba, Russ Colombo, Carl and Chico Marx. Albert Camus, E.A. Poe, Henry Rousseau, Shalom Alechem, Carol Chessman, Alan Freed, and Buster Keaton, too. And each one there, they one thing shared. They've sweated beneath the same sun. They've looked up at wonder at the same moon and wept when it was all done for being done too soon. For being done too soon. A very curious song about you and I and our awareness of the limitation of who we are. Each one on the list looked up at wonder at the same moon and sweat under the same sun and realized this will be done too soon. This is not enough. The scripture this morning of the morning, 1 John 5, is so astounding. Beloved, I write you this that you might know that you have eternal life. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to wonder if it's possible, if there will be more than this. Or is this all we're getting? You have eternal life. I write you these things that you might know that you have eternal life. And it's all just one world away. What are you going to do with it? On the table back here, I'm going to step back just for a moment. On the table back here, I have some items that um, are important to me. This is the first, hammer, uh, first mountain dulcimer I ever made. I've made about 10 of them through the years. And this is the first one I ever made. This one's been to South Africa. This one's been to Europe. This one's been to Central America. This one's been through the war. And this one's broken. 
somewhere along the line about five years ago, uh, something happened, and this, my first mountain dulcimer that I ever made, in fact, you can even tell I, I designed it myself, I put three angels on the front for the sound holes here. I know if you hold it this way, it looks like bad elephants, but um, th this, uh, this mountain dulcimer has got, it's, it's cracked and it's broken, it's got a couple, but it, a piece broken out of it, and all this. I intend to repair this. This was always actually a rather sweet sounding dulcimer. Uh, one of the most fun things about making a dulcimer is you never know what it's going to sound like until you string it up. Uh, when you make a, a mountain dulcimer, you, you design it, you shape it, and all this kind of thing, and then you, you put it together, and then you string it up. And, and that first time you hear, what is this one going to sound like? Because you can think you made it just like the last one, and it, just, it isn't the same. And it's so colorful. I, had one, I have one, actually, in our garage at home that I strung it up, I played it for about one minute, and I said, that's it. That's it. This thing's dog food. It is just garbage, and, and so I've cannibalized it. I just took the strings off of it, and I'm going to end up pulling off this, this piece of the stock, and I'm going to pull off the head scroll, and it's kind of, someday I'm going to get around to it, and I'll recreate, because it was so useless, I didn't even want to keep the thing. I had, it, was, it was so poor. You never know. It's so much fun when you tune it up that first time, and you get to hear it the first time. I intend to repair this dulcimer. I really do. It hasn't happened yet. I have back here also... Um, a mountain dulcimer, uh, actually, uh, excuse me, a hammer dulcimer. Um, this, this is just the soundboard for my hammer dulcimer. Uh, 25 years ago, I made a hammer dulcimer. As soon as I put it together, I just didn't like it. I didn't like the bridges. I didn't like the way the bridges worked, and I, I didn't particularly like the soundboard. So I unstrung the thing. It has 63 strings on it. I unstrung the thing, and I made a new soundboard, and I designed and shaped new bridges for it, and they are still sitting in pieces. I've had this, Andy, she'll, you know, she'll tell you this is honest truth. I've probably had that mouse, this hammer dulcimer uh, probably about 20 years now, unstrung and not put back together. I will do it. One of these days, I, I, I want to find out what this one sounds like. I do. I want to find out what it sounds like. But it hasn't happened yet. Someday I will get to it. This is even more embarrassing. In this case is a set of Elian bagpipes, which I won't be using in the, ne in the next six weeks. Uh, if you understand anything, okay, you've got, you've got regular bagpipes, which are the ones that you blow into the bag, okay, and then you've got Elian pipes, which is the Celtic word for elbow. You pump it with your elbow. You're not blowing with your mouth. You pump it with your elbow. And so I've got uh, some Elian bagpipes here, which obviously I can't pump with my elbow right now. Um, Elian bagpipes. This is really embarrassing. These bagpipes have only been out of this case one time since I bought it. I put it together one time just to see if I could put it together, and I knew I didn't have time to really deal with it, so I t knocked it back down. They've, I've never gotten it back out of the case yet. I dream of the day when I'm going to be able to actually have a lot of fun with this. But there just isn't enough time. There just isn't enough time. If I had time and money, I've looked at, and now I know that some of our camera people would not be real jazzed about this, but if I had the time and I had the money, there are 11 windows up high on either side of this uh, the sanctuary there. You look up there. Uh, there you actually, they are clean now because Norm Kennedy cleaned the outside and Rich Lamoureux cleaned the inside. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. But uh, those windows are clean, the high, those 11 high windows. If I had the time and the resources, I would love to create a stained glass panel for each one of those little blocks, and it would be the, the 22 chapters of Revelation. That the first one would be a significant symbol of the first chapter of Revelation. And the second would be the second chapter of Revelation. And the third and the third, and on, all the way across 22 chapters of Revelation. It would be a, such a kick. I would love to do that. There's just not enough time. I have one more thing on the table here. One paragraph, page 677 of great controversy. There, immortal minds will contemplate 
with never-failing delight the wonders of creative power, the mysteries of redeeming love. There will be no deceiving foe to tempt you to forgetfulness of God. There the grandest enterprises may be carried forward, the loftiest aspirations reached, the highest ambitions realized, and still there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the powers of your mind and your body. The farther you go into eternity, the more you're going to discover. Somewhere out there, there's got to be a planet where the waterfalls fall up and you can swim up the waterfalls. Somewhere out there, there's got to be a planet where there's a little critter that's like a miniature elephant and he's got long blue fur. And when you reach down with your wrist like this, he'll wrap his trunk around your wrist and you can swing him around like this and he giggles. It's got to be, I mean, what made you think that the only critters that God ever created are all on this planet? Somewhere out there, there's so much to discover. Our friend uh, Judith mentioned uh, our friend Roger Bothwell. I remember Roger one time saying, he says, I believe we have a God of economy. I believe that for every star, there's at least one planet. He says, I don't think God wastes anything. There's got to be at least one planet. How long would it take you to explore, to really know the state of Massachusetts? I mean, to really know the villages and, and, and the canyons and the little crevasses and, and the forests. How long, the little streams, how long would it take you to really know the state of Massachusetts? How long would it take you to, to really know the United States? I've been in every state but Alaska. But in all honesty, with some of them, it's just been a kind of going through the corner. I really have not done much in Delaware. Now, Quite frankly, I don't know if there is much to do in Delaware. Uh, there may be. I don't know. I've, I've been in every state but Alaska. And there are places that are as astounding or more. Some of you have been to amazing places like Switzerland. South Africa. Did you know South Africa is almost as big as the United States? and it has just as much variety. I spent three weeks in South Africa. What an amazing country. Ama and, and the variety in that country, it's like the United States, it's just you know, amazing. How long would it take you to really know this world, to be able to really discover this planet? And how many planets are there out there for you? God has put eternity into your heart. I write you these things that you might know that you have eternal life. That God has dreamed and designed. That ultimately he is going to give to you all the time that is necessary. This last Wednesday at Recalibration I showed a piece of art by the French artist Macha Chmakov. It's a sweet piece of art. It has two or three angels, very modernistic style, and they're leaning, like they're leaning into the wind. And the title of it is, Angels Running Toward God. Eternity isn't just going to be your capacity to be able to explore and have fun and learn and grow and play every musical instrument you ever wanted to. If, if I ever, you know, I goof around with guitar and banjo and dulcimers and things like that, but if I ever could play a real instrument, man, I wish I could play the cello. I've always wanted to play the cello. Heaven is going to be more than just me being able to have time to do stained glass and play the cello. Heaven is the place where every time you just feel like it, you can run right to the throne and run up that great mountain of God and just sit down and have some personal time. 
and God will be more than happy to have you there. Brethren, I write you these things that you might know you have eternal life, and it's only just one world away. Our closing hymn is hymn number 216. 216. strange parable he says there's this woman who uh, comes and nags and rags on the judge until the judge finally relents and says oh fine have it your way uh, and and it's a strange parable and and but the punchline to it is that Jesus basically is looking and he's saying and you think God is like that you think you've got to beat God up to get him to finally relent he has put eternity in your heart not because he wants to jerk you around and, and hold that carrot in front of your nose to try to make you behave. He's put eternity into your heart because eternity is long enough for him to have you. He wants you for eternity. This isn't a game on his part. Eternity won't be too long for God to have you. That's why Matthew 25 34 says, one day the king looks and he says, come ye blessed of my father. I've been waiting for this. Beloved, I write you this, that you might know you have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, the majestic and magnificent promises beyond our comprehension You've given us all things and you sustain and you, you promise all things and we know we deserve nothing. It is just because you are so astounding. Lord, we want to spend eternity with you. We, we want to spend eternity having fun. We want to spend eternity with each other. But mostly, Lord, maybe you want us for eternity and that just takes our breath away. We don't understand it, but we praise you. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.